Around about 300 million years ago, Oklahoma began entering a new period in its geologic history. Scientists call this the Permian period. It was a time when the climate was drying out as the continents moved north off the equator. Following the drastic changes of the Pennsylvanian period, Oklahoma found itself located on the western edge of a vast supercontinent scientists call Pangaea. D during the Pennsylvanian and, 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 and most of the Permian time, uh, Oklahoma was uh, fairly close to the equator. It was, it was quite warm. The fact that it was warm is, is one of the reasons we had so many coal swamps form uh, uh, after, after the period of, of Washita deformation. This allowed these large swamps to form. Some people have likened the climate of, of Oklahoma uh, during, during much of the Permian to, to what is in New Delhi in India today. As time progressed, vast arid regions were left behind as the seas began to recede westward into what is now Texas, New Mexico, and Colorado. The lowlands filled with large volumes of mud and sands flowing off the eroding Wichita Arbuckle and Wachita Mountains to the south and east. The bulk of Permian rocks that are in northwest Oklahoma are in a formation called the Blaine Formation. This is a series of rocks called evaporites that formed when the shallow sea slowly evaporated, leaving behind layers of minerals. As the water evaporates, the minerals become more concentrated in the water until they start to precipitate and crystallize. These crystals fall to the sea floor and form layers, and those layers are the rocks that we see today. One place you can find gypsum salt crystals today is at the Great Salt Plains near Jet, Oklahoma. When we talk about salt, that word salt, we're not talking about sodium chloride or table salt. The, the salt that is being referred to is lots of dissolved gypsum. Here, every year when the water is low, hundreds of folks come from far and wide to dig in the thin crust of salty, sandy soil on the western edges of the Great Salt Plains Lake. Here, a few inches below the surface, grow an Oklahoma oddity. Hourglass-shaped selenite crystals, a variety of gypsum, grow slowly and ambitious diggers pursue. Hourglass shape is the one native to this area. You can find selenite crystals other places in the world, but this is the only place you can find the hourglass shape. I like to encourage the kids to get out and get dirty and then tell their folks, don't let them get in too much trouble. <laughs> individuals can go and dig their own gypsum crystals which are there in abundance and sometimes in spectacular size and very very large clusters. Between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock on this day people register what you consider your best cluster or your best blade and they judge to see, judge each one of these and you win uh, cash, some cash prizes and some regular prizes. Be prepared to get muddy. And we wanted to educate our general population on just how special our area is. I believe the river that flows into Great Salt Plains is the North Fork of the Salt River. The water in that river is very high in calcium and sulfate. Uh, calcium plus sulfate plus a little bit of water makes gypsum. Uh, because of the very high concentration of, of the elements necessary to make gypsum are present in the river water, uh, during, during times of evaporation, uh, the salts or the gypsum, the elements that make up gypsum become very concentrated uh, in the water just below the uh, surface, and gypsum crystals form. 
they they actually crystallize uh, directly out of the out of the uh, water just below the surface. The uniqueness of the hourglass selenite crystal led to a special claim to fame. A group of school children from down uh, at Moore came to the Capitol and said they had uh, had been up digging crystals and wanted to start a proposal for the state to make the the uh, selenite crystal the state crystal of Oklahoma and the rest was history like I say you take for granted what's in your own backyard you know the gypsum crystals that you find here are a variety called selenite but that's not the only variety of gypsum there are actually three varieties selenite which forms bladed crystals satin spar which forms radial sets of crystals and alabaster which is just fine-grained gypsum the presence of the crystals is due in part to the permian age rocks in northwestern oklahoma Today, the rocks deposited in Permian time make up much of the rock found near the surface in the western and northern half of the state. The rocks of the Permian period are actually pretty unusual. Geologists call most of the rocks red beds because of their red color. The red color comes from the mineral hematite, or ferric oxide. Oh, one of the most characteristic features, I think, of Oklahoma geology and Oklahoma soils are, is the red color, is, the, is that brick red color. Uh, basically, the, 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 the uh, mineral that makes Oklahoma's rocks red is, is the mineral hematite. Hematite is an iron oxide. Uh, you might call it rust. And due to the unusual climatic, those monsoonal conditions that were present in Oklahoma during, during uh, uh, much of Permian time, uh, those monsoonal conditions caused the uh, iron, the little bit of iron minerals that were present in the Permian rocks to, to oxidize, uh, giving Oklahoma, many of the Permian rocks in Oklahoma, its, its beautiful red color. There are a variety of locations in Oklahoma where red Permian age beds are present. State parks in western Oklahoma that feature unusual landforms or features from Permian rocks include Roman Nose, Alabaster Caverns, and Red Rock Canyon State Parks. In the Gloss Mountains, and at Roman Nose, large buttes of red rock that seem more at home in Arizona or Colorado stand tall over the Oklahoma prairie, as the area was sculpted by rivers in more recent times. One of the evaporated minerals mentioned earlier, gypsum, can be seen throughout the area, and selenite crystals like the ones we dug up are on display at our next stop, along with a whole lot more. You can find selenite not only at the Great Salt Plains, but here at the Midgley Museum in Eden, Oklahoma. If you're a rock hound, be sure and stop by. The Midgley's massive collection of rocks and minerals spans not only Oklahoma, but the entire world. We have several displays of different things from uh, Oklahoma, and the um, petrified rock comes from Oklahoma. It's an Oklahoma native rock. The odd and impressive collection ranges from fossils to flatware, and visitors can see it all in the former home of Dan and Libby Midgley. Most reaction is that they cannot believe that two people would save this much stuff. <laughs> it's not just the collections of rocks at the Midgley Museum that's impressive, but the museum itself. Over 35 different rocks make up the facade of the house. It's a gorgeous piece of masonry. On the road in northwestern Oklahoma, our next stop is in the gypsum beds that make up alabaster caverns. This outcrop is pretty typical of the outcrops you see across northwestern Oklahoma. You have these thick, red, iron-rich shales right under these very bright white alabaster gypsum beds. And this particular gypsum is the same gypsum that forms the upper room in alabaster caverns. This state park is a great way to get a unique look at Permian Age rocks from the inside out. One of the things that makes alabaster caverns so unique is the fact that this cave is formed in the mineral gypsum. It's actually pretty rare to find caves like this in gypsum. Most caves in the United States are in carbonates, limestone or dolomite. Here, underground waters have cut a course through the relatively weak and erodible gypsum deposits, making an elaborate system of caves and sinkholes. 
Geologists tell us the rock in the area started developing about 250 million years ago and the, this area was covered by inland seas and uh, the water deposited large amounts of uh, calcium sulfate, which is better known as gypsum, all the white rock we have around here. Uh, there were upheavals of the land brought, that brought the gypsum layers close to the surface where cracks developed in them and water seeping down through the cracks from the underground streams and rivers that channeled out the caverns. In Red Rock Canyon, modern streams have cut down through the red sandstone, forming steep valleys. Red rocks such as these have influenced Oklahoma cultures through the ages. The influence of these Permian red rocks can be seen throughout central Oklahoma in its characteristic red dirt. And in this red dirt grows one of the rarest of flowers. Found between the towns of Norman and Noble in central Oklahoma is one of the rarest mineral finds in the world. The barite rose rock is both a popular rock hunting subject and has made its mark on the local lore of the area. In fact, Noble, Oklahoma is considered the rose rock capital of the world and has both the Timberlake Rose Rock Museum and an annual rose rock festival. Well, we got people from all over the world, most people well, these people from other countries don't never heard of them. The rose rock occurrences are numerous throughout central Oklahoma. The barite rose, of course, is the state rock of Oklahoma. This unique rock is found in a few other places in the world, but the red colored variety can only be found in Oklahoma. No, we found, actually Doug found a couple of them. Yeah? These ones. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. So I found a really good one and I dropped it. Oh, this one. So it's there's tiny. a really good one laying around here somewhere. It's starting. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. This is a beautiful and, and perhaps typical specimen of barite roses that illustrates the really rose-like or flower-like pattern that gives these rocks their name. Each petal of the rose is a single crystal of barite, barite barium sulfate. And the barite crystals in this case grew around sand grains of the Garber sandstone and cemented and incorporated the sand grains into the rose. So each rose is about half sand and half barite. A little bit of iron oxide, hematite, colors them red, though there's far less hematite in the rose rocks themselves than in the rocks around them in the Garber sandstone. In the late Permian, other changes were underway as Oklahoma's older rocks began interacting with subsurface fluids. Hot fluids flowing through limestones in far northeastern Oklahoma formed valuable mineral deposits in an area known as the Tri-State Mining District. It's a fact of everyday life. You can't drive down a road and not see some relic of, of our mining history. The Ozark Plateau in Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri is well known because it forms caves. Caves are a type of karst topography. And that is the result of water percolating through the rocks slightly acidic, dissolving their limestone. Those dissolved regions are perfect places for hot fluids to come up from deep below, bringing in minerals like lead and zinc, for us to come in later and mine. For another geology in the kitchen moment, we'll look at how karsts are formed. Now karsts are formed when acidic rainwater flows down through cracks in limestone. And that acidic rainwater actually dissolves a part of the carbonate that is in the limestone. And over time, these things hollow out in places where we have fractures that cross, more hollowing out goes on until we have caves and sinkholes. This is how karst landscapes form. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of vinegar and a little bit of baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate. So the carbonate in here will react with the vinegar, which is an acid, and will produce a similar reaction, except instead of over millions or thousands of years, this will occur over a matter of a few seconds. So how do caves and sinkholes really form? What we've got here is a little sodium bicarbonate and we fractured it up in two directions. So now we have a fracture that runs across here and a fracture that runs across here. And in the middle, when fluid is flowing through this rock, the places where these things join are going to be places where there's a little more room for fluid to move through. Now if that fluid is a little acidic, like this vinegar I have here, when it flows through this carbonate unit, it's going to dissolve a little bit of calcium carbonate at a time. So if I start to inject, very slowly, a little bit of vinegar into this spot, and inject a little more, but 
what happens is the fluid remains confined to the fractures and starts to eat its way out of the fractures into the rock beside the joint set. And as we continue to do this over millions of years, in this case we're speeding the process up greatly by using a very reactive substance and a very reactive household acid, what we start to do is create a karst. And in this case, the karst is a little sinkhole. So now what we want to do is color in our caves a little bit so they're a little easier seen. So we've put a little bit of red wine vinegar in with our vinegar. We're going to go ahead and put it back in. And this should stain some of the cave pathways red. You don't want to do this too much or you'll stain it all red. We just want a little for contrast. Okay, sort of see the holes, the little caverns and pathways where the fluid is branched away from the fractures as it's dissolved preferentially into the bicarbonate. This is uh, something that happens in nature over a very, very long period of time. Not in a few minutes like we've done it, but in a few thousand to hundreds of thousands of years. In the early 20th century, the Tri-State was one of North America's richest mining areas. A worthwhile trip over state lines to Joplin, Missouri and the Tri-State Mining Museum tells more about the history of these deposits. The main minerals that are being mined here are zinc and lead, sphalerite and galena. Um, they're both industrial metals. Uh, they're used mainly in the making of batteries, even to this very day, lead acid batteries in your car. Through the first part of the 20th century, mines in this region made up over 50% of the total zinc production of the United States. About the 19 teens with the, with the outbreak of World War I, they became metals of national importance because of course lead is used to make ammunition. Uh, once again it goes into making batteries. Uh, zinc is used to galvanize steel and make it rust proof so your, your lovely tanks and jeeps don't just disintegrate out in the field. One of the final products from the mines here are lead bars like this called pigs. And they're really, really heavy. Uh, okay, I'm going to leave that for someone else today. <laughs> Most of the ore deposits here are from a much older time. And what you have is a occurring here is called a karst landscape. And it is just limestone caverns, uh, naturally occurring caves and tunnels, and voids all underground. This mineral from below becomes superheated and uh, condenses into a steam. And as it comes up and hits these em empty pockets, it cools and then slowly coats these. And it's almost like making rock candy or dipping chocolate where you're dipping something in and adding a layer at a time, only in reverse. You have an opening and we've got a film that we put around it and then another film grows around it and then another film until some of these would grow solid. Some of them would still stay, stay very cave-like in there. In addition to valuable minerals such as lead and zinc, other more common minerals such as calcite and dolomite are found throughout the region. At the end of the busy Permian period in Oklahoma was an earth-altering event. A massive extinction ravaged 90% of all species on Earth. Oklahoma, like all places, entered a new period of history in its development. Leading the way were a new group of animals we've come to know as the dinosaurs.